Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, may we recognize your incredible love in our lives, and more, Lord, may we love one another as you have loved us. Encourage us this morning, comfort those who are struggling. Lord, for each one of us, I pray that you would challenge us from the principles of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The National Retail Foundation predicts that Americans will spend $25.8 billion, that's with a B, dollars on Valentine's Day in 2024. Now, I'm sure each one of you want to do your part in that $25.8 billion. But I also realize that things may be a little tight. You might not be able to come up with quite that much. So uh, I ran across some ideas on ways to still celebrate Valentine's Day, but to spend a little less money. So I'd like to share them with you this morning. Uh, One, you can uh, consider making a homemade card. Uh, Hallmark didn't make that suggestion, but uh, you may want to just make a homemade card. A nice touch. Or maybe find a recipe that mimics your spouse's or your family's favorite dish and make it at home rather than going to a restaurant. You can find discount coupons in order to make things a little less expensive. Now, there were some other ideas, and I'll, I'll share a, a couple of these that, uh, and there are plenty more, but I'll share a couple of these that, that may save money, but these might not bring quite the same results. Uh, One is you can believe them when they say, you don't need to get me anything. (laughs) Another thing you can do is you can buy candy in the Valentine, or after Valentine's Day in the discount bin. And by the way, the longer you wait, the greater the discount. So if you wait a while, you'll get it pretty cheap. Uh, uh, One last one, Uh, if you're in a dating situation, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend on February 13th, and then you don't have to get them anything at all. (laughs) But if you do that and then you ask them to be your boyfriend or girlfriend again on the 15th, they may say no. So just an idea, you may want to... uh, consider or not consider some of those ideas. Love is a topic that we all love to talk about and to think about, especially around Valentine's Day. And God has a lot to say about love. In fact, the Bible tells us that God is love. The love that God displays is much greater than a love that we usually think of. God's love is unconditional and it's sacrificial. In Luke chapter 6, as we continue looking through the book of Luke, we see that Jesus shares what our love as Christ followers should look like. We could call it reckless love. And it's a love that goes against the flow. We see the extent of reckless love in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31. It says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, do also, or you also do to them likewise. This selfless, unconditional love. We're to love our enemy. Jesus demonstrated that reckless love as he loved those people who hated him. And he being God, knowing their hearts, knowing their minds, their thoughts, he knew their hatred toward him, and he knew also that they would eventually be the ones who killed him, but yet he loved them unconditionally. His love did not waver when people disappointed them or him. He didn't give up on them. Example would be Peter and everyone else of us who has ever lived. God's love never wavers. 
It never changes. Not only are we called to love our enemies, but we're called to bless those who curse us. We're called to speak well of a person even when they speak evil of us. Maybe you have an ex-spouse who loves the opportunity to tear you down in front of others or an ex-friend who says unkind things about you. That person at work who feels their primary job in the workplace is to make you look bad and to share it with others. And we're called to resist the temptation to go down to their level. Instead, we're to bless those who curse us. We're to pray for those who mistreat us. What do we want? We want justice or retribution. We want revenge. Instead, God calls us to leave the revenge and the vengeance up to him. And we're told to pray for that person who mistreats us. We must be willing to give up our rights. The Mosaic Law stated that that you could not keep a person's coat until after sunset. You had to give it back. They had the rule of the coat and the tunic. But Jesus said, not only are we to not demand the right of I need this back, you can't take that from me, but we're to be willing to give up even more. Matthew 6 also includes the response to a Roman soldier when they required you to take their, their pack for a mile. You see, the Romans, as the world powers, considered everyone else subservient to them. And so what they would do is, is they would have people from the conquered peoples carry their things. But in order to not make it go out of hand, there was a rule that, that you only had to go one mile. And most of them thought one mile and not one step farther. But what did Jesus say? When they say go a mile, you go two. I'm giving up my rights, doing more to that person I consider my enemy, that person who curses me, that person who mistreats me. But instead of giving up our rights, doing more than ask, our natural response is to be angry, to seek revenge, to try to hurt them after they've hurt us. Jesus said, pray for those who mistreat you. We want to pray, but it's not necessarily the words that Jesus asks us to pray. Now, last week, getting to church was a little more difficult on the roads than it was this week. If you remember last week, we had the snow and the roads were icy. And, and, uh, but I, uh, last Saturday, I was, I was driving, and I think I was going at a reasonable and prudent rate of speed. And this guy pulls around me in this truck, going far too fast for the conditions. He pulls around into the other lane, heads around me, spits gravel up onto my windshield. And I said, Lord, I need to pray for him. (laughs) And so I thought, here's what I'm going to pray. Lord, I pray that you keep him safe when his truck goes in the ditch. I thought that was a nice thing to pray. And Lord, I pray today that that man meets a nice highway patrolman (laughs) who has a conversation with him and and shares a gift at the end of their talk. (laughs) That's not what God's asking us to do. We pray that God blesses them. Pray that God works in their lives, that God encourages them. But it's not natural for us to do. We want revenge. But God asks us to pray for their blessing. And we're to respond to aggression with gentleness. It says when someone slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other. The pain, but even more than that, the humiliation but we're to respond with gentleness. We want revenge, but God calls us to respond with grace. And then it says to be generous even to those who are selfish there in verse 30. We're to respond to greed with generosity. We're to value people more than things. We're to show grace for the action that's done toward us. 
even if the action is intentional. He gives two examples there of, of giving to someone and they don't give back. The first one is you loan them something and they don't return it. And many times it's unintentional, their action. But what if it's intentional? And the second part of that, the second picture is that they take something from you. But you still demonstrate grace, unnatural response. And then in verse 31, to treat others how you want to be treated. We know this is the golden rule. Our natural response is to treat them well when they treat us well, but to treat them poorly when they treat us poorly. I mean, they deserve it. But Jesus says we're to treat them well no matter how they treat us. And then he goes on in verses 32 through 34, and he shares the high standard of reckless love. And in doing this, he shares the actions of natural love to point out the difference between that and the love that God calls us to demonstrate. Luke 6, 32 through 34 says, But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you, you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Reckless love is unconditional. We don't give to in order to gain or because it's something that's deserved. Our natural response, I'm going to love that person when they earn it. Or I'm going to love that person to be kind to them, to do things for them when I feel I'm going to get something in return. But God tells us to take it much farther than that. We're to love at those times, but we're also to love when it's not deserved or earned. We're to love when there's no benefit that's going to come back to us because of our action. And we see that reckless love is supernatural. The prefix super means over and above. And so we're called to have a love that is over and above what is natural. Jesus shared there in those verses that giving in order to receive in return or giving when it's earned is a love that everyone exhibits. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're to love above and beyond. And then in verses 35 and 36, we see the example of reckless love. Beginning in verse 35, it says, But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. The characteristics in verses 35 and 36 are a stark contrast to those in 32 through 34. We're to love our enemies, we're to do good, we're to lend, not asking for anything in return. God's love is different than man's love because God's love is not based upon the, the actions of the recipient. It's not based upon what I get in return from the one to whom I shall love. In our marriage counseling or premarital counseling we talk about the difference between a contract and a covenant. And as human beings, we think of love within the context of a contract. You are going to do this for me, and I promise to do that for you. But if you don't hold up your end of the contract, I don't need to hold up the end of mine. That's love as a contract. But God looks at love as a covenant. A covenant that I make before God. That I'm going to love unconditionally and sacrificially. It's not based upon your merit. It's based upon my relationship with God. And that's the reason that I can love that person 
that is my enemy, that person that curses me, that person that mistreats me. And God tells us that we need to have that covenant love. God is our ultimate example of reckless love. Verse 36 tells us that we're to be merciful as God is merciful. And we see the benefits of reckless love in verses 37 and 38. We've actually been seeing them throughout the passage, but here again in 37 and 38 it says, Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will it be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you. God is the one who rewards our love. That's why I can love that person when I'm not going to get anything in return from them. And these verses here, 37 and 38, share two things that we're not to do and two things that we are to do, and then also the benefits of, of following God's plan for those things. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. In verse 38 that we just read, an interesting picture. I'll read it once again. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. An interesting picture. And... Let me try to, to, to give it in a, in a picture that we may understand. Because what would happen is, is they would take and, and they'd be given grain. And if they were expecting it, they'd bring some sort of a container to carry the, ba- the grain in. But what happened if it was an unexpected blessing? They, they didn't have anything to carry it in. So what they would do is they would take the front edge of the robe and, and they would pull it up into a little little basket there, and, the, and that person would pour that unexpected blessing into it. And that's the picture that they're trying, or that is more than trying, that Jesus is sharing there. But we can think of it this way. Have you ever bagged leaves? Right? You're probably not thinking about that today. But what happens, you, you rake this big pile of leaves, and, and, I mean, it's just gigantic. And you're like, how many bags is that going to take? So if you're like me, and I think you're like most people, what do you do? You, you take and you rake it up and you fill the bag and you push it down and you put more in and more in and more in. And maybe even take your foot and you jump in it or get your kid to come and jump in it or, or whatever you do. And it's amazing how many leaves that bag can hold when it's pressed down, shaken together. And that's... God's response to us when we demonstrate his love to people around us. Now, he's not saying, okay, I give this person $10 and God's going to give me 20 That's not what he's talking about at all. But he's talking about God's blessing in our lives as we demonstrate his love toward others. But also, we see that there's the greatest benefit, and that's that the kingdom of God is advanced. God rewards us for things we do. But we serve God for the benefit of his kingdom. And we see that that's the greatest benefit. As part of God's family, our unconditional sacrificial love draws people to God. So what is the means of reckless love? We talk about this love and and over and over have said it's unnatural. So how am I going to love that way? You say, John, you don't know that person that you're asking me to love. I mean, do you know what they did to me? How can I demonstrate love back to them when they've treated me so poorly? Well, there's some things that we can recognize to help us 
reflect God's love to the world around us, to love the enemy, to bless the one who curses us, to pray for the one who mistreats us, to demonstrate to others how we would like to have them demonstrate to us, even though that may not be the case. What do we need to recognize? We need to recognize that reckless love is a response to God's reckless love in our lives. Verse 35 says, God is kind to the unthankful and evil. We fit that category. We are all sinners. And God loved us. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We need to recognize that our treasure is in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. To show this kind of love that God calls us to show, we need to hold on to the things of this world loosely. And maybe that love requires you to give up some things. And if you're holding on to them tightly, you're not going to be willing to give them up. But if we realize that our goal is a heavenly goal rather than an earthly goal, it makes it so much easier. And not only are things in our possessions, but but what about those things that we consider our rights? But God says we need to be willing to give up all to follow him and love others. We need to recognize that we imitate God when we love recklessly. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself to us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Obviously, verse 2 talking about walking in love. But verse 1, we should have this stuck lots of places in our lives to remind us, maybe on the mirror in the morning, maybe on your car steering wheel as you deal with that person in traffic, all these different things. I need to be an imitator of God. You want to live a big life? You want to make a difference in this world? Think big. Be imitator of God. Now, i got to tell you a quick story about that. When One of our first trips to, to Mexico is mission trips, and if you've been here a while, you know we, we go on mission trips like to places like Tanzania. But uh, we, we were going to Mexico, and we decided, hey, let's all get hats. And we need to put something on the hats, and, and it wasn't like, and it was, I think it was like 1994 or 96, and so it wasn't, you know, hey, Mexico 94. Like, nah. You know, everybody does. Let's do something different. So we thought, we'll, we'll do some sort of an acronym that reminds us. And so I, I was the one who was leading the group. So I thought, you know, this needs to be democratic because I have the best answer, but I want them to feel like it's their answer also. So we're going to take ideas on what we're going to put on these hats. And my idea was Ephesians 5.1. And we're going to have in big letters, B-I-G. And then right down below, Ephesians 5.1. Cool. Be an imitator of God. That's the best. Unfortunately, I was a small minority. And we ended up with Samota. S-Y-M-O-T-A. It's really dumb. Set your mind on things above. Now, that's not dumb. But we wore these hats, and everyone says, oh, I've never heard of that company. I think they all thought it was like a Japanese weed eater company. Samoda. Oh, yeah, good old Samoda. I bought a Toyota, but I'm sure Samodas are good. But we need to think big. Be an imitator of God. And I will love differently when I imitate God in the way I love. And I won't love just when I'm loved. 
I will love at all times. And that is what we're called. And we need to recognize that we can love recklessly only when we rely on God. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, please understand the, the passage there in Philippians 4 is speaking about being content no matter our circumstances. I can be content no matter what I'm going through because I can do all things through Christ. But the principle calls, covers all areas which require a supernatural response. So living in hard circumstances, <laughs> yeah, it's hard for me to be content there, but God calls me to. And loving that person that doesn't love me is another, it requires another supernatural response to love the way that God calls me to love. Corey Ten Boom said, you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. How many times do we try to love without God's help and we fall flat? But when we recognize he is our only hope, then we can love as God calls us to love. And then recognize that our love is noticed when it's not deserved. When I'm loved, when I'm receiving things, it's easy for me to love. But when, I'm, when I love my enemy, when I bless, when I'm cursed, when I pray for the person who mistreats me, that gets noticed. We stand out when we love in the way that God calls us to love. John 13, 35 says this, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And that's that agape love, the Greek word unconditional, sacrificial love. Gary Ridgway received the nickname the Green River Murderer. He admitted to killing 48 women, and he pleaded guilty in Seattle, Washington, on November 5th, 2003. Now, several years back, we looked a little bit at Gary Ridgway's story when we were looking at the topic of forgiveness. You see, on December 18th, during his sentencing, they invited family members of those killed to share or to speak to this mass murderer, Gary Ridgway. One by one, these family members came up to the microphone and told Gary Ridgway how they hated him, how they hoped he would have a miserable life in prison because he was going to spend life in prison without parole. They said that they would hope that he died a terrible death and some even went as far as to say they hoped he rotted in hell for eternity. But then a guy named Robert Rule came to the microphone. And he was a father of one of the victims. But Robert Rule said something different. And it's a short clip, 37 seconds, but I want you to listen to what Robert Rule said. Mr. Ridgway. Um there are people here that hate you. I'm not one of them. You've, you've made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. Wow. Can we love like that? Can we respond like he responded? How did he do it? Because he knew that that's what his father wanted him to do. And so that's what he did to that man who did not deserve it. But by God's grace, Robert Rule was able to do. 
And I guarantee you that everybody in that courtroom that day remembered the atrocities of Gary Ridgway, but the love of Robert Rule. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to love like you called us to love. Help us to love our enemy, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who mistreat us, to be willing to give up our rights, to demonstrate love to others, whether they deserve it or not, recognizing that you love us and we don't deserve your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.